We are here live on YouTube, ready to get your fantasy basketball questions answered, Michael Bolton. Thanks, Josh. It's Michael Bolton here, and it's time for another episode of the Locked On Fantasy Basketball Podcast. Let's get to it. Let's get to it, indeed. You are Locked On Fantasy Basketball, your daily fantasy basketball podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Hello and welcome to the Locked On Fantasy Basketball Podcast brought to you by Basketball Monster. My name is Josh Lloyd and I have been transitioned into a new front office role. I'm also the lead fantasy analyst at BasketballMonster.com and you can find me on Twitter as always at RedRock underscore B-Ball, on TikTok at RedRock underscore B-Ball, and on Instagram at Locked On Fantasy Basketball. Thank you for making Locked On Fantasy Basketball your first listen every day. We are free and available on all platforms. Come across here. I know you've already thumbed it up. I know you've already subscribed, but just do it again, just in case you missed it the first time. Also, double bang, audio, video. We do both of them, and there is a live trade deadline show Thursday, February the 8th, 1.30 p.m. Eastern, as we break down whatever happens during that time. We're here at the moment, though, to get your questions answered, so I'm not going to muck around. We're going to get straight into it, and I am once again joined to answer your questions by the man from Elite Fantasy Basketball. Here he is, Adam Steele and Block. Welcome, Adam. Thanks for having me back, Josh. Appreciate it. It's good to good to have you here, mate. And we're going to get straight into these questions because Dave Rumpler says, Bagley, is this real? Do we care? Sort of, but what's your answer? Sort of. If you're in a 14-team league, sure. But Gafford's still going to be the guy there. And if Gafford's playing 26-27, Bagley can only be so good. I mean, we'll keep an eye on it. New coach, you know, the rotation's probably going to get tweaked a little bit. Uh, but for now, just a deeply guy. Yeah, look, what he did last game was great, right? 25 minutes, what do you have, like 14 and 17 or something with high field goal percentage, but it's a standard Bagley, no threes, no assists, bad free throws, yeah. bad, no defensive stats really. I think he might have had one steal towards the end of that game. But Gafford also fouled out in 21 minutes, and the game before it was a 30 to 18 minute split, which doesn't really mean that you had Bagley. So yes, he was great when Gafford was out. He was great when Gafford got into foul trouble, which will happen. Right? That will happen in, in plenty of games. Gafford might get traded. That is also true. But uh, so many of these answers, Adam, it depends on what you're doing. Like, are you first or second? Then sure, like maybe you can hold and deal with absences or maybe there's a Gafford trade. Then you've got a Bagley who might average 18 and 12 in 28 minutes if Gafford is gone. That's fine. If you're seventh and you go, I, I, I need six threes all the way here to get into the playoffs, well, I don't think you need to do that. Yeah, and points leagues too. Points leagues is a little more interesting because the the holes don't matter as much. Exactly, exactly. Um, All right, Air Dunks, I'm not going to answer that one about trade deadline stats. Actually, you know what? I've given my thoughts. I don't think there's anyone that's a major thing at the moment, and most of the time these things just don't work out. But Adam, I don't know if you've got any different thoughts about players that you're stashing ahead of the deadline. We're two weeks away. Last season, there were three or four pretty obvious ones, I thought. Zach Collins um, was one. Uh, Mark Williams was one. I was interested a little bit in Bones Highland. That one didn't work out. And there was one other one I can't remember that did work out. This year, no one really stands out as a clear must hold this player or must grab this player uh, waiting for a trade. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I mean, you could kind of argue Okongwu because if Murray's gone, are they kind of are they keeping Cabello? But he's probably gone already. I, I still think he's rostered in most twelve team leagues. So that's like the like obvious one. I, th- I think like. I don't know. You could argue guys like Jabari Walker. He's probably pretty likely to hit, but is he high upside? Probably not. I'm keeping my eyes on on some of the point guards that are behind expiring guys. Uh, DSJ is behind Dinwiddie, who's expiring. Uh, DeLon is behind Tyus, who's expiring. But like again, I wouldn't put the odds of those guys hitting hitting very high. Yeah. Look, and I think this is a thing that I've been sort of theorizing throughout the season is that a lot of the time when we talk about these replacement players, the ones that you target are centers and point guards because if a center goes out, a center replaces him. Yeah, Nick Richards, Mark Williams. A point guard goes out, a point guard replaces him. But if a two goes out, a three or a four, they can get a two or three or a four or four different of those players to get an extra four or five minutes each and it becomes more messy. Like nothing super exciting happens with those guys. It's not like, well, our small forward is out, therefore our 12-minute a night uh, backup small forward now plays 35 minutes. It just doesn't work that way. It's like the sixth or seventh or eighth man will get four or five extra minutes, and then it gets relatively messy. So I think you've got to look at like who are the, are there potential starting point guards that might get moved or starting centers and look at backups. And the, the, the one there is, you're right, Capella and Okongwu, but Okongwu is going to be rostered. We hear that DeJounte Murray, D'Angelo Russell, but... Murray's playing shooting guard. D'Angelo Russell, 
okay, Murray would just replace him there. Wouldn't like be a backup coming there in LA. So there's nothing that massively stands out. Things can develop, but at this point, I'm just going, oh, I'm not really sure that, like even like a Jabari Walker, I just think he should be rostered now anyway. I don't even think that's trade deadline related necessarily. So I think from a fantasy point of view, we'll end up with more losers than winners at this deadline, but we will find out in a couple of weeks. What else do we have happening? Well, we had to just talk about this one. James says, this was a nice little Wes Unsailed reference. Yes, because Wes Unsailed obviously uh, was transitioned into a head uh, head office role, front office role. Um, could this change in coaching help Jordan Poole? That is a very interesting question, Adam, because obviously it has been frustrating from many perspectives. Jordan Poole's performance himself, his terrible shot selection, but also I think some of the coaching has been pretty poor. They've used Poole in low usage roles, which obviously is not him. They have prioritized other players over him, which is weird considering he is you know, theoretically the guy that you probably want to have some development into. I don't know. So I guess there is some faith, but the guy replacing Unsold is an assistant coach who was there the whole time anyway. So I'm not holding out huge hope, but I, I won't say it's worse for Jordan Poole, Adam. Yeah, I think you at least have to hold and just see where it goes. I, th- I, th- I think we're all just guessing about whether or not it, 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 it will help him. But yeah, like we know there is theoretically some upside here. So like, why not just, you, you've held up to this point, why not just do a little bit longer and, and, and see what happens? Yeah, like I, I don't think it gets worse. It is possible that, especially a lot of things happen. This is the one that maybe is interesting, but again, it's not really a trade deadline hold. Like what if they move off of, you know, 28 year old, I think he is expiring contract, Tyus Jones. Like if they move him and say, well, now Jordan pulls our point guard, that would have to bump up his value with a new coach and a theoretical new tweak to a system or something. So I'm not having, I'm not holding out huge hope, but it's not going to be, it's not going to be a worse situation. I think is probably the easiest way of uh, phrasing that. Timmy T Hill. Do I drop Scoot Henderson for Nick Richards? I don't want to get railed in the playoffs with uh, another Hornet with the, the two-game week there, obviously. But I think we can just transition this more into the general theory of it because obviously you're talking point guard for center and there's, it's unquestioned who's the better player at the moment and that is Nick Richards. But we'll transition this into like, what are you view- how are you viewing Scoot rest of the season? Maybe that's a trade day deadline stash because I don't believe that Malcolm Brogdon's going to be on that team. So are you thinking that Scoot's going to be valuable rest of season or is it going to be what we're getting now? One good game, you know, two shit ones. I mean, the points and assists I think will be good. I think eventually he's going to be playing 34. Does that mean he's going to be all that useful? Probably not. I don't think he's going to be a guy who starts in Roto the, the rest of the year. Points leagues, definitely. Like, you definitely want to hold Scoot and and see where it goes, but I, I got I got no issue with dropping Scoot for Nick Richards. If if Richards, if you need help with the big, the big man numbers, he's probably going to be better for another month, and then after that, who who knows? Like I wouldn't worry too much about a two game schedule with a guy who's probably going to be like your twelfth best player. Let's say even if Mark Williams is out of the picture the rest of the year. That's true because you know, the, the two-game schedule stuff is something that I talked about a lot in the preseason, but it's for what you do in the first and second round. It's for your, your third round. It's those sort of high-end guys because your back-end guys, if they've got a two-game week, and you go, okay, well, I'll get somebody else in. I think it'll be okay. Like I can deal with that. That shouldn't be your deciding factor on those players because half the time you last four or five picks or the back end of your roster, they can just be cycled through. Their value goes up and down as it is anyway. So if you're focusing on, well, in, in 20 weeks' time, they're going to play two games. Um, I'm not sure I'm going to deal with it. That's really beside the point. It's about what you do with round one one round two, your top end guys, because that's where it really does kick in and, and start to hurt or potentially start to hurt in that situation. Um, as for Nick Richards, it brings up an interesting point with him. Is it like I've been banging on about this for weeks, literally since whenever Mark Williams went down, whenever that was back in 2004 or whatever it was, I was saying, go and uh, yeah, add Nick Richards and no one has added him. He it sits at like 35% rostered. Yesterday, Adam, he scored 21 points. And I was inundated with like five questions. Hey, do we go and add Nick Richards? Like, I'm not sh- Everyone wants someone to just score a lot of points. And that seems to be the number one thing, which I know that's not going to be you guys listening, but what you can transition this into is if we are looking at buy lows or sell highs, when someone has a bad scoring night, you, you buy low. When someone has a big scoring night, the impetus to sell high is there because that is the thing that triggers everyone's reaction. Well, that, that's what I find anecdotally anyway. Oh, oh, yeah, I agree for sure. I mean, uh, I was probably getting questions about Gafford until maybe a month ago, even though Gafford's been pretty spectacular outside of the first two two weeks of the season just mm-hmm. because, like, the guy's going to have a lot of eight-point games, so people don't really value him properly. And then guys like that, like Richards is obviously a poor man's version of that. But uh, with, with a lot of the bigs, like, you could probably scoop him up for a, 
for less than you should be able to scoop them up for. Yeah, just wait to the next one where Derek Lively has uh, 21 points on 10 of 10 Yeah, Lively's a perfect example of that, yeah. And then it'll be like, man, what do we do? Is he a must add? Like, yes, since October the 24th. Today's episode is brought to you by eBay Motors. Every week, the legends at eBay Motors are partnering with me to help you find some of the best fantasy picks on the waiver wire to help get your team, hopefully, to a fantasy championship. Jabari Walker is a name that we've mentioned here already, and I am really interested in what his role is. I don't really think he's going to move out of this starting lineup, and even if there'll be some interestingly bad games and interestingly good games, I just think he's a guy that we hold on to as the value develops over the coming weeks. Look, these things, they're not going to swing your championship race necessarily, but adding little bits and pieces or, or interesting players onto a team is how you can develop a championship roster. And eBay knows all about it. eBay knows that getting a championship team is about each player being a perfect fit, and that is the same with your vehicle. With over 122 million parts, you're number one ride or die. You can make sure that your ride stays running smoothly. Now, last week, Adam, I asked Kayla, who was on here, about yeah, whether she's ever referred to her car as her ride or die, and she didn't have a car, so that fell flat. Do you have a car, and is it your number one ride or die? Um, my old well, well, now that now I'm a dad, so we had to get the old uh, SUV. But back when I was working in finance and I got my first car, I used to call her Brenda. So does that count? <laughs> like I don't know. I gave her a name. Well, that, well, so. that, yeah, well then that is 100 percent right. So if you are looking for any of the 122 million parts for your Brenda, eBay Motors has it. And with eBay Guaranteed Fit, it's guaranteed to fit your ride the first time, every time, or your money back. Plus, at these prices, you're burning rubber and not cash. Keep your ride or die alive at ebaymotors.com. eBay Guaranteed Fit, only available to US customers, eligible items only, and exclusions apply. Unfortunately for you, Adam, can't uh, can't get it done in Canada. Just another L that Canada takes here. Much like us, US gets all the advantages with eBay Guaranteed Fit. What a what a distinct shame that is. Let's get into more questions here across the uh, fantasy landscape. So, what do we have to? I think the Yancey one's probably one of the bigger things that's happening at the moment. Um, what else have we got here? Do I drop Levert or Malik Monk? Well, neither. I don't even know. I don't even know how to answer that one at this point. All right, I'll just, I'm going to throw a question to you. Just that's not from a listener here, but how do you approach the famed, fabled shutdown risk? Like the oh, well, this guy is not going to play end of season. How do you like approach that? Do you, are you proactive? Do you dismiss it out of hand? Do you think well this is not really a problem for most leagues? How you approach? How do you approach that? It depends what your playoffs are, but generally I, I don't ignore it, especially with teams that we've seen in the past kind of start messing around. We saw the Spurs kind of rotate their guys in and out last year. We saw Portland shut down their guys pretty early. I think Grant was second, third week, week of March. The problem is, is that if you're in a competitive league, everyone knows that. So if you're trying to do it now, you're trying to do it right before your league's trade deadline, you're probably not going to get too much. Like, like Usually my approach is if I'm worried about that, I try to do something about it maybe around the end of December. I think after that, everyone starts looking at the trade deadline and then people start thinking about shutdown. So probably too late, but it is something I, I do pay attention to. But it, it's also not something that, like, I'm not trading Wemby or something like that. I, I, I would rather roll the dice, even though there is some downside there. That's sort of look how, how I said. And again, I've tried to set my leagues to finish so that, that is not a problem. And if I went back and looked and I did how things worked last season, you're right. Like, I think Jeremy Grant missed two games in finals week and Lillard maybe missed the last game of finals week and Halliburton missed maybe a game that week. And that was it. And then it was the week after when all the fake injuries started. But the NBA literally made a point of saying, we're not going to have this shit fly. We'll see whether they actually are real on it. But they specifically yeah. mentioned that. Yeah, they talk about rest and that sort of stuff. But buried towards the end was, you know, we're not going to allow our teams to fake shut down players at the end of the season. It's going to have to be examined by independent doctors to see whether they're actually out and injured or if they're available to play in order to imp improve your draft stock. So yeah. I think that it still happened. I just think that previously it was like the last three weeks. I think now it might be the last 10 days. And as usual, you shouldn't be playing head-to-head -head leagues in that period of the season. Old Man the Sea, can we read into what is happening in Utah with their point guards? Keontae played about 10 minutes in close games and it seems like 25 in blowouts. Is this a pattern moving forward? I don't know about whether that is a pattern, but as much as we sort of liked Keontae early in the season when he took over from Taylor Horton Tucker, they've found a different mix and it works. And there's four guards in that mix. 
Any of those four guards, Adam can play point guard. So I have absolutely no interest at this point in Keontae George. There's no clear, well, they need this to happen and they're definitely going to hand him 30 minutes. And I, I don't think that is happening at all, really at any point soon. Yeah, I, I I don't think so either. I think we kind of watch at the deadline. I mean, Utah was competitive last year until they weren't. But uh, there hasn't really been too many signs this year that they're about to go down that path again. So I think for now, at least, probably, uh, yeah, Keontae, Probably, probably limited. Walker Kessler probably still minutes all over the place. I, I think until their current setup stops working, I think they're going to keep going with it. What's the thing is that they're actually good at the moment as well. They were they were they, they, were, good, yeah. they were feisty last year. They were sort of competitive, but they're actually good. And the guys who might be dealt on this team, well, it's not going to be Colin Sexton because I think they think they found something there. Um, uh, Chris Dunn, what are they getting out of that? Like, I'm not sure that's going to be a part of anything. Jordan Clarkson is, amazingly, he is Utah somehow. Like, he is a key part of their their team and their their culture and all that sort of stuff. So I'm not really sure that they're going to make these big... Like, if someone's going to move, maybe it is John Collins. Maybe it is Kelly Linick. But even that, I'm not even certain that it happens. So I, I wouldn't be waiting for... I wouldn't be waiting for Keontae George to be handed this big, um, this big role because I just don't think it's going to happen. All right. Yeah, and they, yeah, there's no there's no rush for Utah either. They can just start them at point guard next year and, and see how it goes. His, his development's not going to be make or break depending if he plays 32 in March versus 24 or 25 or whatever that ends up being. Yep, I agree. Um, Marcus says, why did I say Kobe White's upside was low and we could drop him? I literally never said that ever. I told you to hold him the entire way. So, Marcus, I reckon you uh, might be... That might have been me. I thought oh, he'd be it? like... Uh, top, yeah, well, not necessarily. I, I thought he'd be yeah, like top 100, kind of, but I was also not banking on 37 minutes a night. Yeah, well, so, so for me, it was like I was looking at him like 32, 33. I was like, okay, yeah, I probably won't be that good. Um, but this is back when he's doing top 200. So. This is the thing, right? Like... You don't expect him to play 39 minutes a night, but he also has um, evolved into their number one offensive option, which as much as I was bullish on on him the whole way through, I didn't yeah. think that was going to happen. I thought there was no way that that's going to be the case, but he's awesome. Um, Davo Fulisic says, is Vince Williams' rest of season value real? Adam, you can go first. I don't know if he's going to be as good as he ha- has been lately, but probably just because somebody has to, uh, has to have the ball and... And, and take over and his defensive numbers are decent enough where I, I think there's a fair amount of upside there. Uh, definitely surprising because this is like a super low usage guy who shoots 40%. But when you get a situation like Memphis where there's just no real like starter level guys in the backcourt, like stuff kind of goes out, out the window and you just kind of have to see what happens versus uh, focusing more on like what happened before kind of stuff hit the wall. What um I don't know how much work you did on Vince like in the 2022 draft class like I did a little bit of work mm-hmm. with him and but he always translated incredibly high. Part of the reason I downgraded him he was an older player and obviously went towards the end of the second round. But he always had these crazy like um translation numbers coming out of was he, was he from VCU? I think it was VCU that he came from. These crazy numbers, right? And it's like oh this guy translates amazingly. And a lot of the draft guys were like man, watch this guy he's a hidden gem. But he but he was old. And you said okay, I'm glad you said that like hmm, you know maybe he doesn't keep up this level. But let me. I'll tell you what he's done the last seven games 16 points, six rebounds, 3.5 assists, 1.7 steals. He's shooting 53 from the field, 83 from the line, on 46% from three and 62% from two. So I'd say that the three point shooting, probably not going to hold at 46. The two pointers at 62, probably also not going to hold. And that means he's maybe not a 16 point scorer, he's a 14 point scorer. But 14, six, and three and a half, 1.5 steals, half, half a block. 2.2 triples. Why? Uh, like you said, 18 usage. He's not doing it like getting every shot in the world. He's just doing everything within the flow of the offense. And to be honest, he is the flow of the offense. He's like everything at the moment. He's he's the guy that's doing everything on this team. So while like he's like 30th over the last two weeks, he's probably not going to be that, but he could easily be a top 50 player the rest of the season. I, I don't think that's crazy to think because what he does is not, it's not just that insane shooting that is not it's not he's not averaging 20 points a game with one rebound one assist nick young style he's doing it across multiple areas so even if one thing takes a hit the other thing can maintain so I, is it real you're like yes like to a degree yes i don't think it's going away and if your league doesn't have him rostered well you guys need to figure it out and get him rostered like literally immediately like this is a one of those ones where it's like well he's not necessarily a big scorer and he's not a big name but uh, who cares like he's just he has to be rostered there's no excuse not to i think what else do we have? Um, all right, so 
Ricardo, I regret putting one of your questions up, but I'm going to do it now. He says, is it now essential to have RJ Barrett on your roster? People know my thoughts on RJ Barrett. Now, Adam, you're, you're from Canada, so you're going to have a completely biased opinion on RJ Barrett like all, Canadian, yes. all Canadians do. So give me your take on what RJ Barrett is doing at the moment. I mean, he's been objectively decent. Yeah. I, 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 I mean, I'm not a, I was not an RJ fan when he's in New York, I guess. I'm a huge RJ fan now he's in Toronto, or I hope he's, hope he's decent. But uh, just, I mean, he's been the same guy since Duke. Uh, he's the same guy in New York. I mean, players definitely go to different teams, and they can be better fits. But they don't become different types of players. So I, I think at least fantasy-wise, he's not all of a sudden going to start doing stuff on the defensive end. I mean, he's been shooting well, but – and maybe he does get a bump. Maybe he's a better fit in darker system than Bibbs. But he's not going to shoot as well as he has. And then you still, and then the free throws, they kind of come and go. It looked like he'd made a jump there, and now now he's slipping again. So, uh, I mean, points leagues, yeah, I like him. But category leagues, he's going to be a back-end guy problem. That's that's the thing, right, is you talk about being a different player, and he sort of, he sort of isn't, but it looks like he is. The rebounds are slightly higher, or well, they're significantly higher, and that could easily hold. He's averaging one more assist per game in Toronto versus New York because he's playing four extra minutes. That's about the same there. Defensive stats, still completely putrid. His free throws have dropped off, but the difference is in shoot, instead of shooting 47% from two, he's hitting 63%, and his career numbers from two are 43, 46, 44, 49, and now he's at 63. So... Will I trust 12 games worth of data or will I trust 300 games worth of data? I think I know which way I'll go. Like, it's the 300. And the other thing is that, like, the players who are perimeter players who shoot 63% from two are, like, Kawhi Leonard, Kevin Durant, probably end of list. Like, no one does it. No one does this. So while he might have improved in certain areas and his minutes are definitely up and he is playing well at the moment, the thing that's driving it is just a field goal percentage that is... 10, 11, 12 percentage points higher than what he's ever done in his career. And I just don't buy that at all. So should you have him? Sure. Should you rely upon it? No. Like, it's just, it, 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 and that could change, but I just like to back the data. I like to back what's happened for four years plus college, as you said, the exact same player in college and versus a 12 game hot streak of finishing. That, that's how I view it. And people always, uh, people always be uh, hating on me for, uh, for hating RJ Barrett for some reason. One of those guys who's got, a, uh, a large portion of fans I have uh, I have found out recently. Today's episode is also brought to you by Grammarly. When it comes to writing, Grammarly is there to support you from start to finish. It helps you. It's, it's, it's not just a spell check. We know that. It's there to support you with grammar because that's part of the name. It helps you find um, ways to improve your grammar, passive voice, run on sentences, um, it just little corrections that might go miss, even to the, the, the best like second check or your know, Passover of your writing. This is to improve what you do. And it can also help you generate ideas. It's not there to write stuff for you. It gives you the assistance you need if writing is a big part of your work. It can summarize sections of text. It can make it easier to read. It can shorten it. It can provide all those little checks to make everything look a little bit more polished. I use it basically every day in my work um, and everyone who's doing any form of writing, like you're going to benefit from using Grammarly. So go to Grammarly.com slash podcast and you can download it for free. That is dot com slash podcast. All right. Hayden. I don't like these questions, Hayden, so I'm going to highlight this just to tell you that I don't like it. But how much would DeJounte hypothetically affect Reeves if that trade happens? All right, so this is how I would look at it. Adam, you can disagree with my methodology here at all. I will, If a trade happens, I will always go in and adjust my projections the same way that you would and see how it all fig- figures out. But the easy way to look at it is a who's in, who's out. And let's just say it's a straight swap, D'Angelo for DeJounte. It may or may not be. So DeJounte Murray moves into D'Angelo Russell's role. What changes? Like what, what changes there for Reeves? Is DeJounte Murray going to be a higher usage player than what D'Angelo Russell currently is? Is he going to be a higher assist rate player than what D'Angelo Russell currently is? And I think the answer to that is no. Like I, I don't see how that would change a single thing, honestly. It might be marginal, but not enough that makes a big sweeping change across uh, the fantasy basketball landscape. Uh, yeah, I agree. I, I, I guess you could cover, maybe argue it it would hurt him a little bit because Murray's not going to get bench while maybe Russell they 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 cut his minutes again later in the season. But but that that's like a stretch. Like that's as basically as far as I would go. You could also like 
come up with an argument, well, Murray's a better defender, so it makes it easier to play Reeves big minutes. But really, I wouldn't. I would just assume pretty similar and then kind of watch. It's one of those things that, again, that like, and maybe this is a, a problem that's more exclusive to me or even people who are playing in um, yeah, a lot of different leagues is like the brain power you have to expend to think about a hypothetical scenario of a trade that may or may not happen that you don't know the other pieces or other deals that are involved in. And then does that drop Austin Reeves five or 10 spots or make him five or 10 spots higher? And the result is like so negligible that you've wasted an hour trying to figure it out that it's not worth it. Like that's, it's not going to be well. If this guy moves on, then phew, big, big jump or he's going to move from a 35 minute player into a 20 minute player, um, which is a, usually a relatively easy calculation to figure out. Like the other thoughts here, was this going to hurt him significantly? Well, what are you going to do about it? Even if it does, um, it's just so, it's so small, or so unknown that it's the effort to outcome ratio. I don't think is high enough. Yeah. And then you got to consider like, does, is LeBron healthy the rest of the way in this scenario? Is AD healthy? They've been healthy so far, but I mean, I don't know. Will they be down the stretch? No. Yeah, ex- oh, exactly. Like he's, yeah, he missed last game with that, uh, or two games ago with that uh, ankle issue. Um, all right. G. Yosef, here's a question. We talked about playoff schedule and we talked about don't worry about like Nick Richards, but what about Luka Doncic? Who should you target to get back for Luka? I said it from the jump. I did. I was very much, I'm not drafting Luka in the top four or top five of a draft because those other guys are quite similar and I don't like the two game week. Plus, I hated the fact that when I was watching the World Cup, he was limping every single game. His hip was banged up. He just looked like he was carrying this gigantic load and all the way through the season, it's the same thing. It's his limping to the locker room at halftime yesterday, an ankle, a hip, a groin, whatever. He just looks beat up and he is having to carry this team and I am worried there is going to be something that pops up. He's already had a couple of absences plus a two game week. So I, he plays, he has to do so much. His usage is sky high. His minutes are sky high. I worry there is going to be a big hit, but the problem is it's Luka Doncic and his production's great. So what is like the worst sort of player, Adam, that you would take back in a trade for Luka? Because honestly, like if you could have got before his you know, injury management, Tyrus Halliburton, like I'd do that. Shea, Embiid, Jokic, like any of those top five, easy straight swap. But how far down do you go? Like, do you take Anthony Davis back? Even, but he's got a two-game playoff week as well. So h- how far down do you go in that list before you would consider keeping Luca through that you know, risk of the, the build-up and, and wear and tear plus the two-game playoff week? Yeah, I, I would train for a guy like Don Mitch. I, I, I think something like that is probably worth it. You get the playoff, you get the bump. Yeah, slightly different guys. You, lo- you lose the assist, but Donovan's been pretty spectacular this year. So I, yes. I, I think I think targeting guys like that who maybe don't have the name value that Luca does, uh, just because you think other guys, okay, in that range, you look like like KD, like you mentioned, AD has the same same issue. I don't know if I drop, like, like Lillard to me feels like a decent drop. Um, so I, yeah, I, so take, I, I would probably I go with what about, Mitch, okay. Mitch Taylor probably. All right, let me throw a couple of names. The two names here, I, I, Mitchell I think is a really good one. Um, and I think that given the the reputation that he has at times, I think you could get Trey Young plus something for Luca. And Trey, despite you know, the way that people hate this guy, he's averaging 27 with 11 assists on 1.4 steals and gets the line eight times and shoots 86%. Like, He's like a first-round yep. player this season, but people hate him for whatever reason it is. And yeah, you know, or, or is Devin Booker plus something else worth it as well? Booker's around that, you know, that turn zone as well. I think that you could probably get those sort of players. Like I wouldn't want to push down further into like a you know, Paul George or a Larry Markinen sort of a player. Um, but Kawhi, Trey, Booker, Mitchell, I think those sort of players, and you might actually be able to squeeze. You might be able to squeeze something out of it, whether it is like a, a top 80 player or something like that. You might be able to upgrade the back end of your roster at the same time. Yeah, I, I think that's a really good call. And I, I think it's probably a pretty build dependent. Depends what you're doing with your team. Like, for example, if you're punting field goal percentage, like, yeah, that Trey deal looks really nice because, like, Trey's pretty spectacular in punt field goal percentage. And then you're getting something on top of that. Plus, you're getting the, the playoff schedule bump. Like, a move like that can actually, you can come out. Like pretty far ahead, I, th- I think, if you're smart about it. And I think if you asked a novice fantasy basketball manager or honestly a majority of fantasy basketball managers, there would be a million... I'm sure there's going to be people here in the chat or the comments who'll be screaming, Veto! You can't do trade for Luca. It's a veto. It's a terrible... What a terrible trade. But it it might end up being actually better for you, let alone a back-end upgrade on your roster as well. So it's, it's really like, yeah, important to be able to sort of disassociate the... 
the name value or the outside appearance versus what it actually does for your team. Alexander says, how much do I believe in rookie usage in the last quarter of the season for tanking teams? And if so, which rookies would you target via trade or waivers? Now, it's a really good question, Adam. Do I I don't have to believe or not believe in it. It's, it's just a thing. Like, it happens. Like, we see rookies yeah. get more comfortable. It is... And I'm glad you brought this up and I talk about this all the time. People will often shout, what's the rookie wall? Well, it's not because the majority of rookies get way, way better as the season goes on. So you'll hear that that gets chucked out as soon as one rookie has a slump. But as a general rule, every rookie is better in the second half of the season, the last three months of the season, the last two months of the season, than the start. They all improve and you will see this usage bump go up. But like, who am I targeting? Who are the guys? Like, that's the hard thing. And I said this at the start of the season, Adam. It was like, how many of these rookies are actually going to start games to begin the year? Because it's a great draft class, but where the hell are the, the easy opportunities for these guys? So like, is Bilal one of those guys? Is he going to ramp up his usage? I'm not sure that he can. I'm not sure he's that player. Uh, the one I want to watch is Kobe Bufkin because if they clear house and apparently he's untouchable, well, then he's going to get run through the last four weeks of the season. But who knows? Like he's played literally four minutes in the NBA. And that's like, that's yep. the biggest like gamble of all time. So how do you view that rookie usage thing? Because I think it's undeniably a real thing, but do you make any moves for it? Um, none of it. Like it depends from year to year. I, I, I mean, the guy who's probably going to get that is Scoot, but Scoot has so many warts that it's hard to really justify a, a long-term stash. You also got to remember that in, might not happen until really late in the season too. Yeah. Like not all rookies are unleashed at the beginning of March. Like, like some guys just play big minutes for two weeks, you know, like even when you look at Shen Gun, who was uh, spectacular when he was a rookie, he got unleashed like pretty late where, where leagues that ended early, maybe you got the finals in there, but, but you, you, you didn't really benefit that, that much for it. So like, yeah, it's something that's real, but it, it's not something that, uh, like, I'm going to just tank my team for a, a month to, like, to stash these guys. Like, is Asar going to play more in March? Like, it's Monty, so who knows, but probably. But am I going to stash him for a month and a half for the chance that he does? Probably not. I think most of the time with these situations, it's understanding the players and their scenarios and reacting as soon as something happens versus, like, doing it two, three weeks in advance. Because, again the odds of that working are pretty low. Like it's just unlikely to, to happen and you might have a 10% hit rate on it, but you lose so much waiting this long to, for it to come to fruition. And you're right, there are teams that take it differently. There are some teams that use the all-star break and they come out of it and they've got, right, we've got a completely different game plan now. For some reason, they need those four or five days. I get it because the NBA is a grind. You're traveling, you're moving. They have those four or five days off. They all coach till we get together. All right, let's pivot. Let's do this. There are others who don't do that. There are others who wait until the middle of March to do it. There are others who wait until the beginning of March to do it. But there will, there will be one to two teams. Who, who who it is, I have no idea. But will change their rotational decisions and their like offensive hierarchy straight out of the All-Star break. That'll happen straight away. And you'll get these like, this guy is going to sit and we're working on a buyout scenario. That'll happen for one team probably. And there's a staggered approach, but we don't, we don't know what that is. And we don't know who that is. You've just got to always keep your ear to the ground looking for those signs and being able to react like that versus like, I'm going to try and, because it's hard enough to predict what's going to happen today, tomorrow, in game from first half to second half, let alone like which team is going to do this at this point um, for this guy. It's that becomes almost impossible. And it's, you know, the, the plus EV on it is absolutely dick, definitely a negative EV. You just, it's not going to, you're not going to win doing that. I don't think. Yeah. And you also have to think like opportunity costs. Like if you're holding these guys for a month, there's going to be a bunch of nice pickups that pop up over that month and you're going to miss out because you're stashing for something that might have a 20% hit rate. Exactly. Um, last question, Pat G. Are we holding Bruce Brown or are these low minutes sticking? All right, this is interesting because he played 28 minutes. I think it was the first game in Toronto. Barely played the first half, looked great in the second half. And then Darko was like, no, nah, like we're going to play you low minutes. And Darko came out and said something pretty illuminating, which I think is really interesting. He said, I want to give the guys who are going to be here long-term opportunities to play in our closing groups to see how they go. That's why Grady Dick played in that game the other day, not that he was playing well. And there is way too much noise about Bruce Brown not being on this team that I just don't think he's going to get these minutes. But he might move to a situation where he does. Now, if he moves to New York, I don't know if that situation is better for him. It would depend who comes back. And I don't think they're moving on from like a Josh Hart or a DiVincenzo. So it's probably like going to be a grime. So he plays like 18 minutes or something, which is not really useful. I do think that in a lot of cases you can hold Bruce, but what's his actual upside if he plays 30 minutes? Is it like top 90? Is that worth a hold when you don't actually know what's going to go on? And there's again, probably less than 50% chance 
of it working out. I, 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 I don't know that it is. Yeah, Bruce, really nice player, but I think everyone kind of like when they think Bruce Brown is upside, they think about him filling in for Jamal Murray versus what he's going to be in most scenarios. Really nice mm-hmm. player, but he's probably going to come off the bench in most spots. Uh, I would actually probably just hold for now because quickly beat up. So like sure. you, might, you might get a couple nice games out of him. But yeah, I, I agree. Probably not high upside this year. There's just not a team out there where he's going to have the ball in his hands a bunch. That's true. But it also just brings me to one last thing regarding that earlier question is a guy that's done nothing. And that is, that is Dick because if they will probably move Brown, I would guess they look to move Gary Trent as well. And if they've literally come out and said, we are prioritizing giving Dick minutes in high leverage spots to see what he can do, then they are going to give him minutes through that. He might not deserve that. He might not have earned, but they're going to give him minutes that enable him to be in situations that are useful. Now, would he start over Gary Trent? Like, like yes, I think he will at some point. Figuring out when that is, I've got no idea. But that's a name that, again, he's done nothing. He's been terrible all season. But they have literally come out and said, and that's the sort of thing you've got to hear, like they've come out and said, no, we're going to put him into these spots and, and see what happens. And is it worth stashing? No, but it's worth having the name in your head, I think, Adam. Yeah, I agree with that. I agree with that. Grady, I mean, at Kansas, he he, he was a good shooter and his steal rate was pretty good. So keep an eye on him. But yeah, he's been bad in the G League. He's been bad in the pros. Yes, so, his, yeah, his, his chili numbers are horrible as well. Uh, yeah. But yeah. he looked, you know what, it's actually flashed for him, just not to keep it too long, but his passing in the last couple of games has looked all right. And if you can add, like you know, Gary Trent might get you four assists across a year, but if Grady can get you three, three and a half, there's just a little bit of something extra on the top there. 17 points, two threes, um, your three rebounds, three and a half assists, 1.3 steals. He's a pretty good steals guy at Kansas as well. So there's a little bit of something there to uh, to pay attention to, but I am not going to hold you any longer, Adam, because it's already been too long. So I'm going to take that question off the screen. And I'm going to say thank you for coming on and answering the hard-hitting questions from the listeners and viewers here and tell people what uh, what you're doing uh, over at Elite Fantasy Basketball. Yeah, I guess I guess stretch run now. I'm going to start talking about the deadline a little bit. We're still doing projections every day. We're still doing the the, re, the recaps every day. So we're, we're going to grind it out in, until the end. We'll start talking playoff strategy too. Uh, so lots of good stuff coming down the pipe. Yep, go and uh, check out Adam over there. Adam, you should be using Grammarly as well for all of your uh, for your recaps. Make sure everything is... I do. There you go. Yeah. There you go. What a what an organic um, organic there recommendation. Adam, thanks for coming on. I'll let you get out of here and then we'll, uh, we'll wrap this show up. All right, perfect. Thanks, Josh. Guys, you know what to do. You come across here. First of all, go and, uh, go and thank Adam for coming on the show over on Twitter as well. And hit the thumbs up here. Hit the like button. Hit the trade deadline show with a pre-like. We want to hit a 1,000 of those pre-likes. So go ahead and do that as well. And we want to get 20,000 people watching that show. So tell your friends. Tell your mum. Tell everybody to get in there and watch it. If your mum enjoys um, uh, Kelly Oubre dick jokes, like jump in. It's going to be a, a great time for everybody. Guys, we are done here. Thank you so much for watching, everyone. See ya.